I, I just wanted to go over the example of retiming once more, but now with reference to the output samples that are being produced, right? So I'm going to take the simple example of uh, this particular uh, uh, recursive uh, data flow graph, right? So A to B, uh, B to C, and then C back to D. Okay, the arrows are missing on the A to B and B to C, but uh, they are in the sort of left to right direction. Okay. Now, I'm going to call the output of A as OA, output of B as OB, and output of C as OC. And the reason for doing this is basically, you know, it sort of helps to make it clear when a particular output sample is generated and the fact that the actual values of the output samples are distinct from the iteration in which they are produced. Okay, what do I mean by that? Let's take this example further, right? So what I have drawn below is basically an example of what the schedule for this ABC graph could look like. Right? So what we have over here is there is the A0, then B0, C0. That's the first set of execution of each of those elements, right? A, B, and C, followed by A1, B1, C1, then A2, and so on. Okay. So this is generally how uh, the system would proceed. Okay. Now, what that means in particular is that when A0 has completed, OA0, that is the zeroth output of the operation A, can be considered to have been produced. Okay. So OA0 happens at this time. OB0 happens after B0, then OC0, and then you know OA1, OB1, etc. Right? The whole lot of them uh, happen in sequence after that. Okay? And the way that we consider it, at least, what we would say is that the A0, B0, C0 combination can be considered as one iteration, that is iteration number zero. Then the A1, B1, C1 would be grouped together as iteration number one, and so on. Now, as you can sort of imagine, right, this grouping into iterations is somewhat arbitrary. It's not clear that why I'm calling something as iteration zero and something else as iteration one. Of course, I mean, you know, if I have iteration zero, the next iteration would be iteration one. That makes sense. But when does iteration zero start? Is there some, you know, sanctity to a particular starting time somewhere in the system? To be frank, no, right? I mean, this is just some kind of convention that we are uh, working with. And, uh, because of the assumption that signal processing algorithms are working essentially on infinite streams of data, we have to take some arbitrary point in time and call that time zero. Okay, so now what was the point of this? What happens if I retime along this dashed red line that I have shown over here, right? So what would a retiming along this dashed red line look like? Essentially what, you know, because of the sort of positioning of the delay elements, the initial tokens that I have over here, pretty much the only retiming that I can do would be to remove the delay element from the C A edge and put it onto the A B edge. Okay. What happens as a result? Effectively, what I can now think of is that, you know, the, I mean, the way that I drew the uh, diagram last time also, we have the B0, C0 followed by A0, which means effectively that what used to be A0 is now marked as A minus one. But if you look at the values over here, right, the OA0, effectively what I'm saying over here is OA0 is still produced at the same time as it was earlier. In other words, the A minus one iteration, capital A minus one, is the one responsible for producing the output OA0, right? And if we take that as the meaning of the different iterations, right? Effectively, what you can see is from the point of view of the output samples, the entire behavior remains completely unchanged. It is just a question of what am I going to call as iteration zero and what am I going to call as iteration one, right? In this case, it has shifted. It is not the exact same set of, or the order of operations that I had last time around, okay? So what I call as an iteration is mainly from the point of view of the convenience that I gain in terms of, you know, how the problem itself, uh, how I view the execution of the operations in terms of the actual outputs that are generated, provided that, you know, I have taken care that this A minus one, this initial value token is set correctly and generates this OA zero, I should get exactly the same sequence of outputs as in the previous case. So this was just an example to sort of reinforce what we already discussed last time around, right? So it's not really something new. Okay, now what I want to do is take some more examples, right? 
of free timing, a different way of sort of looking at it. What I'm going to discuss over here is what I'm going to call the concept of retiming across a node. Okay, so consider that there is one node in a graph somewhere, A, right? It has some input, and I mean, I don't care where the input is coming from, which is why I have not drawn the source node, and I also don't care where the output of A is going, right? But what is important for me is to consider that on the input edge coming into A, there was one delay token. Okay. Now, this red box that I have drawn is essentially some kind of, you know, uh, box boundary that I am drawing around A plus the delay element, the initial token, right? And the reason I'm drawing that over there is to say that if I draw this boundary, and I am trying to look at the behavior of this node as seen from outside the boundary, right? I really don't care on which side of A the delay element is present, right? Of course, the reason for this is that A itself is a time invariant system, which means that whether I first delay the input and then feed it into A, or I compute the value of A and then delay it by one sample, right? Both of them should give me the same behavior. So in other words, from the outside of this red box, the behavior of both of these things should remain exactly the same. Okay, and there is no real difference in terms of functionality. Right? This is what I'm calling retiming across a node. And the reason I'm calling it that is because effectively, I am not trying to sort of say, you know, I'm not even looking at a cut set or, you know, I'm not sort of trying to say, I need to find a complete cut set, which will divide the graph into two parts. I am saying that if I just draw this red boundary, implicitly all the nodes, all the edges that it is cutting form a cut set, right? And what is this cut set? There is A on one side and every other node in the graph is on the outside of the cut set. Okay. So anything which basically is just you draw a circle around a node, right? All the edges coming into that node or going out of the node together constitute a cut set, right? That is in some ways a trivial form of a cut set, which involves only one node. Now, if I go further, right, let's say that A had two inputs and three outputs, right, I can do the same kind of retiming over here, right, first draw the boundary around it and say that from the point of view of this boundary, whether I have the delays on the left hand side or the right hand side does not make any difference, right. The important point, of course, that you need to notice that when I removed the delays from the input edges, I had to add the same number of delays on each and every one of the output edges, right? Otherwise, from the outside of this red box, the behavior would actually look different. Okay. The other thing that you might notice is the total number of delays over here present inside this, right, is equal to two because there are two edges with delays on them. But over here, the total number of delays has become three. So in other words, this retiming transformation, right, need not necessarily preserve the number of registers or delay elements present inside a circuit or a data flow graph corresponding. Okay. That's an observation. I mean, you know, it, it might be sort of intuitively, you might think that, okay, when I'm doing this, I should not change the number of delays. That's not necessary. The reason why it changes over here is because A has more output edges than input edges. The moment you retime around A, it is bound to increase or decrease. I mean, if I'm doing it in the opposite direction, it would change the number of delay elements. The other thing that you can notice is that, you know, this three lines that I've put over here for equivalence is intentional. It works both ways, right? It's bidirectional. Right? So in other words, I can either say that the left hand side can be transformed to the right hand side or if I were starting from the right hand side, I could transform it back into the left hand side. So both are equivalent. You can't say this is the original and that is the final, right? Of course, I mean, given a graph, given a particular starting point, you might make changes to it. But in general, there is nothing in the graph itself which says that this is correct or this is the original. one. Okay. so. What if I have multiple delay elements, right? And what do I mean by multiple delay elements? Let's say that I had two delays on the edge coming into A, right? I'm not going to draw the red boundaries around A, but you know, you get the idea of the way that I'm looking at this problem, right? 
what I'm saying is this is equivalent to having one delay before A, one delay after A, right? Once again, the way to look at this could have been that, you know, I draw a boundary around A. So both of these edges essentially constitute the cut set, right? I remove uh, one delay from the incoming edge to A and add one to the outgoing edge. Okay, so in other words, for the edge that is going in this direction, I do a minus one. For the edge that's going in the opposite direction, I do a plus one and end up with this, the graph shown in the middle. Okay, I could take that one step further and of course, you know, transfer both the delay elements all the way to the right hand side. And of course, I could do this at one shot also, right? Once I have drawn the uh, boundary, there's, you know, nothing saying that I should do it only like one delay element at a time. Okay. Similarly, if I had a more complicated uh, subgraph, right, uh, where this node basically had, you know, two edges coming in, three edges going out, and the appropriate number of delay elements on each edge like this, right? What I've shown on the top right hand side is where, you know, the what is written in green basically shows that the output of B is retimed with a plus one. That is to say every outgoing edge has a has one delay element added to it and correspondingly every incoming edge has one delay element subtracted from it right you can think of it exactly the same way as i said earlier draw a circle around b right anything coming inwards subtract one delay element anything going out add one delay element okay similarly i could have done this twice right which means that i could have gone straight away from the one in the center to the one on the bottom right where I would effectively, what I would do in this case is you would notice that there is now zero delay elements over here, right? Whereas the others basically have all their counts increased by two, right? And of course the other, the other incoming edge to be also has minus two, but all the outgoing edges have plus two, right? Now this should automatically also, you know, tell you that this Next possibility, that is to say, you know, if I try doing this, plus three and minus three, right? That's not going to work. I'll end up with a negative over here, right? So that won't work, okay? So up to plus two minus two is fine for this retiming, right? And in the opposite direction, can I do that? Yes, I could have gone the other way as well, right? where I do a plus one on the incoming edges and minus one on the outgoing edges, right? In, in other words, what I'm saying is from the point of view of the rest of the circuit or the rest of the system, all four of these uh, designs are completely equivalent. The rest of the system cannot tell the difference because it only sees data tokens moving in and out of these elements, okay? Now, like I also discussed last time, you can apply this both in the context of completely synchronous digital circuits where the node B, for example, would be just some combinational element and the delay elements that I'm putting over there would actually be physical registers driven by a clock. Or this could also refer to a data flow graph where the node could be either, you know, some piece of software or some other complicated functionality which takes multiple clock cycles to execute. And the delay elements are basically, you know, the storage space for tokens which are moved around from one node to another. Whichever way you look at it, functionally, the concepts are exactly the same. So the retiming applies in both of those cases in precisely the same way. Okay. So now let's take this forward and look at how we could use this concept of retiming to improve the functionality of a graph, improve the behavior of a graph in some way, right? So this is once again, the graph that we have looked at a couple of times in different examples. I have three nodes, A, B, and C uh, with execution times put in brackets over there, right? 40, 20, and 10 respectively. And, you know, a C to B edge with one delay and C to A edge with two delay elements on it. Okay. So if you look at this, what you can see is that the critical path right, is essentially given by A to B to C 
and it has a length of 70 time units. Okay. And what is the critical path? It's essentially saying that sequence of nodes through the graph, which have to finish one after the other in within one iteration, right? So in, in order to complete one iteration, I will need to finish each of these nodes in order one after the other, right? Automatically, that means that the time between iterations is going to be limited by this time unit, uh, this number 70. Okay, so can I improve that, right? So the first question that I would like to ask is, uh, or rather, I mean, you know, uh, I would like to improve that obviously, and then the question becomes, how do I do it? And what I'm suggesting is, let's retime along this green line that I have drawn over here. Okay. And what is the green line? It is once again, you know, just a, a cut set, right? A division which basically isolates A on one side and the rest of the graph on the other side. What happens when I retime across it? Any edge which is going into A, I do a minus one. Out of A, I do plus one, right? And as a result, I end up getting one delay element on the edge A to B. And the two that was present over here, right? This reduces to one in the final uh, system, right? So, in other words, what I'm saying is both of these graphs are essentially equivalent, right? The one is just a retime version of the other. So, what happens with this retime version? Now, let me look at the critical path once again, right? And if I do the analysis, what I'll find is there are two blocks. Right. If I look at A now, essentially what I find is there is a delay element or you know, uh, storage both on the edge coming into A and on the edge going out of A, which means A has essentially been isolated. Right. But it has a delay of 40 time units. B and C are not isolated from each other. They do have uh, a direct edge between them. So in other words, C can execute only after B. But even if I combine both of them, the total delay is only 30 time units. Okay, and if I take that into account, basically what I find is that the critical path now has become 40. Okay, which is basically limited by A in other words. Okay, now if you look further at this graph, what you will find is that if I really wanted to find what was the minimum time that I could take for finishing one iteration, right, that is given by the iteration period bound. So if I just take this graph, try to schedule it straight away, uh, how do I put the elements one after the other? The minimum time that if I had unlimited resources, essentially, that I can have for the system is going to be 35, right? And the reason that is given is because I have two loops over here. One is A to B to C and then back to A, which has a cycle mean of 40 plus 20 plus 10 divided by two delays. And the other one is B to C and back to B, which has 20 plus 10 divided by 1. The maximum among these is 35. Right? You will notice that, you know, actually what ends up happening is this loop over here, right, still has two delay elements on it. Right? Which basically means that because the loop itself has not changed and the total number of delay elements on it has not changed, the IPP is unchanged. Right? So what does it mean to say that the IPP is unchanged? It basically says that uh, this retiming transformation that I have seen over here has helped me to reduce my critical path, but it cannot help me to reduce my iteration period bound. 